All right, if we could get everyone to come in and take a seat. If we could round up all the folks out in the hallway and close the doors, we're gonna get going. We've got a big Saturday for you. I'd like to start off this morning um, with just a few minutes. We're, we're going to uh, do something special here this morning just for the first three minutes. Um, many of you who have attended our events in the past have heard me say that uh, one of our inspirations in starting the uh, Steamboat Institute was an organization called the Leadership Program of the Rockies. Uh, the Leadership Program of the Rockies is a more intensive nine-month training program uh, for emerging leaders in the state of Colorado. It, it's, um, it's, a, it's a model for the nation, what they're doing. Um, I think there, we have several uh, Leadership Program of the Rockies graduates, myself included, in the room today. Would all of you who are LPR graduates or board members please stand? We've got quite a few. All right. Um, so now I would like to invite uh, to tell you a little more about the upcoming 2012-13 class of the Leadership Program of the Rockies, the Assistant Director, Crystal Bezaiden. Okay. Good morning. So Leadership Program of the Rockies is honestly one of Colorado's best kept secrets. We have well over a thousand graduates here in the state and I guarantee you know more of our alumni than you just saw stand today. We do train 65 emerging leaders each year in the constitutional timeless principles and how they build into public policy and better equip those leaders to become more effective leaders in action. Currently, one, ha one half of the Colorado State Republican uh, elected officials are um, graduates of our program, which we think is wonderful. We have other graduates, though, that have also been advancing school choice throughout the state of Colorado, um, primarily in Douglas County, where been, they've been passing school choice vouchers and actually defeating the unions. And that's being um, replicated in many other counties throughout our state. We're currently accepting applications for our 2012-2013 class. The deadline is actually fast approaching. It's coming up August 31st, where applications and two letters of recommendation are due. So what's the time commitment? It's a nine-month program. We meet the second Friday of every month, October through June. We are based out of the Denver metro area, so our classes are held throughout the Denver metro area. With the exception in February, we hold a two-day conference at the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs, um, which is uh, an absolutely wonderful opportunity, and if you've enjoyed your weekend here, I encourage you to consider joining us down at the Broadmoor. We um, have two unique curriculums that we thread throughout the program as well. Defenders of Capitalism, where we'll read Atlas Shrugged and Economics in One Lesson and teach our class members how to make the moral case for capitalism. We also have another curriculum called Defenders of the Declaration, Formerly, it was called Defenders of the Constitution, and we better equip you to be able to defend the idea of the Declaration with one of the top five constitutional scholars in the country, Dr. Thomas Cranawitter, a former Hillsdale professor. So we take, uh, who are we looking for? We're looking for individuals that have a sphere of influence, emerging leaders, people that are looking to impact public policy at every different level. We're not necessarily a candidate school. Our graduates do go on to be volunteers on um, you know, campaigns or help nonprofits. They're presidents and CEOs of companies looking to get government out of their way so that they can be more productive. We take people that are individuals that are ages 21 through 70, and we're looking for really a diverse mix from around the state, um, different career backgrounds, different education backgrounds, and it's, it is a competitive process. We get a couple hundred applicants each year, and through a 15-minute interview process, we narrow it down to a group of 65 individuals. Um, we are unique to Colorado. We are currently working on a demonstration module to be able to take our program national, and it's so wonderful that we have so many different states that are, um, people from different states that are represented here, and 
will hopefully be coming to your state shortly. Um, another quick note is that we have a graduate program that we launched this last year called the School of Persuasion, where we train um, some of our best graduates how to be more persuasive with the principals. We do have some information out by the table um, and registration, and I highly encourage you to come up and ask me any other questions that you may have about the program. I'll be here for the rest of the conference and also tonight at the Coyote Gold Margarita Party, so I hope to see all of you there. Thank you. Alrighty. The Steamboat Institute owes a debt of gratitude to the Heritage Foundation for supporting us since we started in 2009. They have been just tremendously helpful to us in so many ways, connecting us with speakers, giving us advice, putting on their annual resource bank conference where we go and meet incredible speakers and get advice on how to run our organization better. Um, in fact, many of you asked, how did you find out about Ann McElhenney? Um, well, it was because of the Heritage Foundation. We attended uh, their Resource Bank Conference at the Broadmoor uh, back in April, and Ann McElhenney spoke, and uh, my husband Rick and Ann Lowe and I attended, and after she spoke, we said, we've got to get her to Steamboat. So we were really, really glad we were able to do that. So that is why it's, it's especially nice to be able to introducing our uh, next two speakers because they're both with the Heritage Foundation. Matt Spaulding is the Vice President of American Studies and Director of the B. Kenneth Simons Center for Principles and Politics with the Heritage Foundation. Matt is a constitutional scholar, historian, and a best-selling author. And in fact, he will be signing copies of his book, which if you've not yet purchased a copy, I encourage you to do so. We still hold these truths, rediscovering our principles, reclaiming our future. Um, Matt will also be joined this morning by Ernest Iztook. Um, Ernie describes himself as in recovery after 14 years as a U.S. congressman from Oklahoma, I might add, my home state, 25 years overall in public service. Um, he's now a distinguished fellow with the Heritage Foundation. He hosts a national uh, daily talk radio show from 9 to noon Eastern every weekday. Um, Ernie likes to explain to people that He's been a politician, a reporter, and a lawyer, but at least I've never sold used cars. <laughs> Ernie served 14 years, and I, if I sound like I'm being too casual by calling him Ernie, it's because once you get to know him, it just doesn't feel right to say congressman. He's, just, he's such a friendly guy. 14 years on the House Appropriations Committee, including subcommittees that handled national defense, homeland security, transportation, health care, education, the EPA, the White House, and numerous other agencies. He chaired multiple subcommittees. So we are just delighted to have with us this morning Matt Spaulding and Ernest Iztook. Am I up first? I guess so. <laughs> I usually defer to the congressman. But he's recovering, so that's okay. Good morning. How are you doing? It's, it's great to be here. I've not been out to the program before. Thanks for inviting me. I know the, uh, Rick and Jennifer have been trying to get me to come out, uh, and I'm glad I am, uh, I am here. It looks like you have a few new people, some additional numbers, I understand. Must be maybe an election going on. Uh, here I thought this was going to be a boring affair this year, 2012. It's going to be a debate between whether uh, Mitt Romney was merely a felon or a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, something larger seems to be afoot uh, in, the, in, in the nation out there. Many of us have been saying for some time, of course, this is going to be a crucial election, uh, a tipping point election, something important was going on. Uh, but other people weren't necessarily saying that, were they? Uh, but now something seems to have changed. And with the addition of Paul Ryan to the ticket, we now have a debate about ideas. That's going to change the discussion, and the American people now have a choice, a choice they've been given not merely about policy solutions, although that's a major part of it, but about the actual very direction and trajectory of the nation. 
Over the last couple of years, Mitt Romney, I think, has absorbed that argument. He's seen it in a large sense. Even the president is arguing that's what this debate is about. It's about two different visions about the country. This isn't surprising if you think about it for a minute. Since at least the 1980s, back when Ronald Reagan first broke the patent off the New Deal, both political parties have been looking for a grounding of their politics. Where are they going? And I think what we're seeing right now in this period is both political parties are going back to their own roots. The liberal progressive argument for those of you who have heard my talks before and seen my work, goes back to the early progressives, the turn of the century. Those who wanted to replace the principle of the Declaration, the Constitution, with the notion of evolving rights, everything changes, nothing is permanent, and unlimited government. And this fundamental rejection of the American idea. We see it playing out in the New Deal, and especially the Great Society, that reform period. Right? Government is the solution, and government is always the answer. President Obama is trying to revive that sense of liberalism. But he misread America. He misread the, over, the 2008 election. As a result, he had a massively misreading of, of, of his policies. The United States still remains, if you look at all the polls, it has for some time a center-right nation. 2008 was a misreading of where America was. Classically, in Obamacare, Dodd-Frank legislation, massive pieces of legislation meant to radically transform and change the very workings of the nation by using government as a vehicle to bring about a different type of nation uh, completely. The response to that we're more familiar with. We can't stand these bailouts. Crony capitalism, spending, debt. But behind that, an arguing about the role of government rejection of bureaucratic rule, and a sense of loss of American exceptionalism. Americans were looking for a different compass. And what did they go back to? They didn't look for a new compass. They didn't look for a, to, to invent and change the direction. They went back to the old one, the original compass. They started carrying around copies and pocket constitutions, and uh, flying the Gadsden flag. Right, looking to the Declaration and the Constitution itself. And we called it the Tea Party, going back to the Boston Tea Party, and then the 2010 election. That movement and that effect, the reaction to, Bo to Obama's overreaching, has pulled the Republican Party by pulling it back to the roots of conservatism, back to its historic roots, a roots of a party that began in defense of the Declaration and the Constitution, pulling it back to look at the roots of American greatness, the notion that rights do not come from government, but they become from the laws of nature and nature's God, that government is not unlimited and bureaucrats don't run our lives, but government is limited and we are self-governing individuals and citizens. A notion of an American dream, a dream of opportunity and of pursuing our own sense of happiness not a liberal dream of using government to solve all of our problems and reshape society. And so here we are, and those two great worldviews are engaged in a very powerful way, in a way that they've never been engaged in 100 years. There has never been a clear, decisive, and divisive debate between these two ideas. And yet here we are now. There's something interesting if you look back in history at watersheds. You know, most of American history is made up of turning points. And in electoral politics, they're watersheds. They're turning point elections. 1800, the Jeffersonians destroy the Federalists. 1860, the Republicans under Lincoln realign the nation against slavery. 1896, McKinley, the second great Republican realignment. 1932, 1936, the great Democratic, FDR, New Deal realignment. To some extent, even 1980, when Ronald Reagan started to break through the liberal realignment. But what is interesting about all those periods and each one of those elections is that any great moment in American electoral history, 
looks back to what America is about. Every great election, if you go back and read, is a debate about what America means. And if that election is clear and the American people engage and make a decision about what America means, and if it's decisive and divisive, which means it's close, as all those elections were, and if those ideas are carried out in a policy agenda after the election, and it's continued and held to, one can realign American public opinion. And by realign, what I mean is you put a public opinion back in line with what it ought to be in line with, namely its principles. That is the larger objective of what we are trying to do here, is to fundamentally change the direction of our country, to rebuild a go governing coalition, and to align it to its right purposes. Yes, we need to solve the immediate crisis before us with a bold agenda, spending reform, tax reform, health care reform, regulatory reform, energy reform, a whole a whole array of things that are necessary to be done now with a sense of urgency to change the direction of our country. But we have to remember the larger task. The task we ultimately want to bring about is a renewal. A renewal of America as a land of opportunity and prosperity where one can pick up and do what one wants to do and has the right to the fruit of their labor to restore a sense of American exceptionalism, that indeed this country is different and unlike any other nation because it is based upon a sense of God-given rights. And we have a system of law to hold that, uphold that idea. To revive a sense of what American culture is about, that we're not ruled by, by administrators, but we're ruled by our institutions and ourselves and our families. We need to restore the great sense of protecting those things, especially religious liberty. And the long run, what we need to do, our greatest task, is to rebuild constitutional government. For some time, the American government has gone off its moorings. It is far off track. It is so far off track, it is sometimes hard to know when to start and where to start. Constitutional government does not control our judiciary today. We need better judges. Constitutional government increasingly does not control the executive, who increasingly thinks they are so imperial they can do things without approval of Congress and legislative authority. And Congress itself, even in its current form, does not pass many laws. They pass laws that give power to bureaucrats who increasingly run things for us. This is the larger work before us. To bring our policies the policies which are the day-to-day -day things which create public uh, decisions, to bring those things back into harmony with our principles. That's the hard task. That's what we will start now, but that is the work of a generation. The objective is not merely an electoral victory, although that is what you must focus your time on right now. You must think of an electoral victory as the beginning of a cause and a movement to renew this country. I'm increasingly convinced the American people want that debate, which is why there is such an abiding and strong interest right now in this de uh, uh, decision. I believe that we will change the course of our country, and I believe, God willing, we will see renewal of the American idea itself. Thank you. Well, good morning. You know, during, during my years in Congress, and I got to serve with good people like Bob Bupre. Bob, good to see you. And uh, I love to go to, you know, have town hall meetings with people and begin it by reminding people, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> and uh, the funniest thing, some of them thought I was sincere. Now, 
doesn't mean I don't want to help people. But you, I, you get the point. I don't need, if you have to explain a joke, you've lost it already, right? <laughs> and I, I appreciate the introduction, but, uh, you know, she, she stole some of my best lines, uh, reminding people that after the years in Congress, I am indeed in recovery. Uh, that's a lifelong experience. There's no established 12-step program um, out there for us. And um, I, I enjoy, though, as, uh, as I say on the radio, you know, if nothing else, I can always serve as a bad example. And, uh, you know, if you, if you can't learn from uh, your own mistakes, at least learn from some of mine, uh, because you certainly do make them uh, during that time. But it also, it also sensitizes you to the difference between what is being said and what is being done. And, uh, by the way, any time uh, we're still building out, the show is new, uh, we're still building out radio station affiliates, so no matter where you are, you can go to istook dot com and listen uh, online there. Uh, the show time is 9 to noon, that's Eastern time, so adjust, of course. And I, I really appreciate the chance to, uh, when I, after I left Congress, to uh, be part of the Heritage Foundation. When I first began at the Heritage Foundation, right after I left Congress, uh, they had me there as a visiting fellow, and they decided they were going to hang on to me, so they gave me a title of Distinguished Fellow. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping if I behave myself someday, I'm going to be known as a jolly good fellow. <laughs> what, what I try to do in speaking with people is not just to speak to the choir. We know that we have the nation that's divided, you know, you can call it red, you can call it blue, uh, all of those things. But the challenge is we need to get more people to understand the principles, and to join us. If all we do is maintain the support we have, we're not going to make progress, especially with a country as evenly divided as it is. So what I try to do is to, to find the things that make a difference to persuade people that are, are not yet quite with us in conservative cause, not quite there on believing in limited government, not quite there on understanding the significance of the Constitution, of the rule of law, but to speak to people in a way that will, uh, will hit them where they live. Now, I happen to believe that it's a mistake for people to say, well, you know, vote for me because I've got a great new idea. How many new ideas have you seen in your lifetime? I like to hear from people that say, you know, I believe in some enduring principles. And everything ought to be following those enduring principles. Sometimes what we need is not reform, it's restoration of things. And I really appreciate it when Glenn Beck had his big rally in Washington. He talked about, he talked about restoration uh, rather than reformation. And that makes a big difference. I spent... Uh, a uh, year and a half ago, I spent several months up at Harvard. Interesting, very interesting experience. And uh, I, I taught a study group at the Institute of Politics there on propaganda in American politics today. Because propaganda is all around us and most of what we hear in political discourse today is propaganda. It is not really intended to inform. It's intended to change the way that you behave and change the way that you think by giving you carefully selected facts. They may be true facts. They may be true but misleading. They may be false. But in any event, they're propaganda because they're trying to persuade you. They're trying to bring you over into some people's camp. President Obama, of course, is a master at doing this. And, uh, you know, you, you heard his speeches many times, for example, when he would say, you know, America, America has, uses, what is it, 20, 25 percent of the world's oil, but yet we've only got 2 percent of the proven reserves, and that's why we've got to do something about it. Well, I understood what was really, what were really the numbers, and so I started writing about our dangerous dependence on foreign chocolate. <laughs> because, you see, we only, we only create 6 percent of the world's cocoa, and we consume 20%. We have this dangerous dependence 
on uh, cocoa that comes from foreign countries. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just a disaster in the making. And besides which, uh, I realize that if you read the, the Energy Department's own paperwork, if you, uh, they actually say it is misleading to say that our oil is the 2% of proven reserves. I mean, it's right there on the Department of Energy's website because they're only talking about what's being produced now. They're not talking about what's available. What's available, yeah, we got a couple of hundred years and we'll go after it. And of course, that's why they're trying to stop it because it, it interferes with, uh, with their agenda. But what, uh, what I wanna share with you is the challenge of communicating with people who, uh, who need to be persuaded, who need that extra bit of information. There was a time when conservatives thought that, well, all we have to do is remind people of the communist threat and remind people that big government requires big taxes, and that would persuade people. But you see, today, most people did not grow up with the duck and cover drills. I did. Uh, so, you know, they don't have the same concept of national defense. And especially today, about half of the American people do not pay federal income tax. Now that makes a big difference in their thinking. And 10% pay 70% of the federal income tax, not 17, 70. And yet we're told they don't pay their fair share. Here's the problem. When you try to appeal to people on the basis of smaller government or lower taxes and Half the country is not paying that tax. It doesn't mean anything to them. You can talk about things on a national scale, but until you bring it down personal to them, where it makes a difference to them, they're not going to be persuaded. In fact, they're apt to go with the person that says, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do things for you. I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to give you, whether it be college expenses, whether it be take care of your home mortgage, where we've got a lot of people that are getting thousands of dollars each month from the federal government to help pay their home mortgage. And in fact, the president wants to make it worse than it is right now. There's a big push, very rarely reported behind the scenes. The president refers to it in his speeches, saying that he wants this, this program to help people to refinance their mortgages at today's lower rates. Now that sounds good, right? You don't know his plan. His plan is because they cannot refinance because they're underwater. They owe more than the home is worth. Until they get it paid down to uh, the point where the home is worth more than they owe, they can't refinance. So he has this program where the federal government will pay down their mortgages. And right now there is one federal bureaucrat standing in the way, Ed DeMarco, who is being villainized by the left it's not reported. He chairs, a, what's the correct name, the uh, Federal Housing Finance Authority. I've got a little bit wrong there. But uh, his refusal to go along with that plan is what is stopping President Obama from doing this by executive fiat. Now, this is just one example of the things that they're doing, trying to appeal to people's self-interest. We need to appeal to people's self-interest. And I want to explain that to you in a moment. I think the elevation drives you out more quickly here. How do we appeal to people's self-interest when we can no longer to appeal to taxes? And the key is, and uh, I refer to this as what I call the kitchen table agenda. Where do families usually sit down and talk about the family finances? Kitchen table, right? I don't, how did that start? Anybody know? Why do we pick the kitchen table, you know? I, I don't know, but we do. So I refer to it as the kitchen table agenda. Unless we can show people that they do have a personal financial stake, unless their self-interest is involved, we only have limited appeal by talking about national interest. When we have so many people who are teaching the concept that government exists to give you things, 
they don't understand what government is taking away from them. And I don't mean just in the abstract as far as freedom. I'm talking about things that uh, actually, actually cost them. Let's, let's begin with health care, why don't we? Why is health care so expensive? Yeah, third party payer and so forth, yeah. Uh, most plans that deal with health care talk about shifting who pays, okay? Whether we have a federal program or a state program or a third party or changing the relationship with insurance companies, but they don't talk about why are things so expensive in health care. There was a great study done by PricewaterhouseCooper. It was, it's actually 10 years old now, but it was done on behalf of the American Hospital Association, and they documented and this was even pre-Obamacare, they documented over 130,000 pages, 130,000 pages of federal regulations on health care, even into such minutia as how a clinic, a doctor, a hospital has to do their laundry. And for every hour they spend with a patient, the doctor, the nurse, the other provider has to spend a half hour to a full hour dealing with the federally mandated paperwork. Do you know what this does to costs? when you have this much non-productive time imposed upon the system, even before Obamacare, we have over 2,000 state mandates on what has to be included in health insurance. You cannot buy a plain Jane health care policy. As the American Council, of Life Insur no, health, American Council of Health Insurers has put it, you have to buy a Cadillac or nothing at all. Well, if that's your choice, you may end up buying nothing at all because I can't afford the Cadillac. So people go uninsured because they cannot buy basic coverage because state law and state edicts and federal law and federal edicts won't let them because hospitals and doctors have to spend so much time complying with federal dictates, they have to charge you for that. And then of course when they see Medicare, Medicaid patients, where they have lower reimbursement rates than they do from private payments, they charge private pay patients more to make up that difference. The government is at the root of the expenses that we pay in healthcare. You get rid of the red tape, estimates will vary. You can bring down healthcare costs probably by at least a third, maybe by half, if you didn't have the overregulation by the government. Do people know this? No, they typically don't. But yet, when you talk about affordability of things, what is the government doing to make it happen? Energy prices. You've probably seen or heard some of this little footage in 2008 when he was a candidate, Barack Obama saying, under my energy plan, electric bills will skyrocket. Because the, the dirty little secret, of course, on alternative energy is it's five to 10 times more expensive than energy generated by fossil fuel. Even after they subsidize wind and solar, it still is so much more expensive than fossil fuel. And yet we have all the federal dictates, the so-called renewable energy standards that require, require utilities to use alternative sources to produce your electricity and raise your electric bill. Why? Well, because they don't want us to go after fossil fuel because they believe with that it's no longer global warming. It's global cremation. <laughs> At least I, I, I get that impression from listening to some people. I mean, the threat is so dire. If you look at the cost of things, President Obama was uh, bragging uh, a few months ago, you know, we're gonna help people out. Energy, gasoline prices are too high because we won't let people build refineries, we won't let people drill, yada, yada, yada. But gasoline prices are so high, so we're gonna require, we're gonna make sure your cars are now gonna get 54 miles a gallon. Isn't that great? How much is that car gonna cost? They don't know for sure. We're still a few years, a couple of years away from that edict kicking in. But I found it fascinating a few months ago, the New York Times of all people ran an article saying, gosh, the higher price of cars compared to the cost of gasoline, and if you get the energy efficient models, 
they calculated that would generally take you about 10 years, maybe 11 or 12, to save enough on gasoline to make up the difference for the more expensive new cars. In fact, they said unless gasoline reaches $8 a gallon, that's going to be the case. You're not going to be able to, uh, uh, to get the money back. Now, the problem with saying it's going to take you 10 years to get back the difference is that most people only keep a car six years. So you're never going to make the difference back. But the cost of cars that go up. How about light bulbs? Oh. <laughs> I know. I've got, uh, you know, I, I, I do try the newfangled bulbs. I've got a closet. Uh, I put the same wattage bulb of the new one, the you know, CFL, in there as my old incandescent. I can hardly find things. The light's just too dim. Have you noticed that? The quality of the light is not the same. They leave that out. Uh, it's been researched by people like, uh, uh, how do you pronounce it, Rensselaer Polytech, and uh, also Cal Poly uh, have done studies on this, on the quality of light. It's just not the same, but the price isn't the same either. You know, I could, you know, on you know, a good day, I could go into Walmart and get four bulbs for a dollar. Uh, now I'm lucky if I can do four dollars for a bulb. And do you believe they really last, you know, wh what do they say? You know, this bulb will last three years or 30 years or 300 years. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, it, it, it's about the same because I don't put a label on each light bulb in my house to say, when did I put this in so I can track how long it lasts. And, and besides which, if you look on the box, when they say it'll last umpteen years, if you look on the box, the fine print says, if you only use it three hours a day. So, you know, they get you one way or the other, but it's another federal edict that costs us money and maybe it saves you some energy, maybe it doesn't, you figure out for yourself, but it's not just light bulbs, it's appliances. I mean, I, I'm glad I don't need a new washer or dryer or refrigerator or anything of that, because all of the energy efficiency, whether you're saving power or whether you're saving water, has driven up the cost of appliances by hundreds of dollars. It's not just the add-on features. It's the federally dictated costs. I mean, I recall uh, one friend of mine in Congress, uh, Joe Nolenberg, went after the, uh, the plumbing requirements dictated by EPA, the 1.7 gallons per flush that doesn't always do the job, okay? Anybody here ever had that situation? <laughs> Okay, all right. And uh, he wanted to change the law on it. And he was on talk radio all over the country and people responding, yeah, yeah, that's stupid. But uh, he found out that the, the manufacturers of toilets wouldn't help him because they had already retooled to meet the federal mandate and they didn't want that retooling expense. Well, that, that goes on everywhere in the federal government for us. So when you look at the things that the federal government does that dictate higher costs for us, energy, health care, the, um, the, uh, the cost of everything that we do or buy and uh, durable goods, the, the way that costs go up. But let me mention two more, college costs. College tuition has been going up at twice the rate of consumer prices more swiftly than health care. Do you know why? Let me, let me go to a fundamental basic. And this has not been reported. They had testimony at a House committee this year. And uh, frankly, the person leading the charge on this is Lamar Alexander, senator from Tennessee, who of course is a former governor of Tennessee and a former college president as well and a uh, former secretary of education. And as he describes it, 30, 30 years ago, Medicaid consumed 8% of state budgets. Now it consumes 25% of state budgets. And states have balanced that by taking it out of higher education. Or as another senator puts it, this is Tom Harkin, a Democrat from Iowa. Uh, let, me see, let me get this quote right. He says, Harkin says, only higher education has paying customers. 
whereas most of these government programs, of course, are giving things to people, right? Medicaid, for example. Only higher education has paying customers, so they make them pay. Why don't people rebel against that? Because the federal government makes up the difference by increasing student aid, Stafford loans, Pell grants, whatnot. Federal aid to students has gone up 164% in the last decade. That's even after allowing for inflation. So federal policy insulates state governments from the pushback of the consequences of what they were doing because of federal policy. You, fo you follow that? The federal government gives them the money, or gives students the money alone to make up for the higher cost of higher education because states cut back their funding because the feds induce them to put it into Medicaid instead. It's just, it, it gets so complicated, but the point is, why do you think we have such a debt burden on college students today? Why do we have the, uh, the accumulated student debt is over a trillion dollars, more than all the credit card debt, more than all the auto loan debt in the country? Because the federal government says, you know, get a loan now so you don't notice. You don't have to pay till later. And people get pulled into the trap of, you know, get it now, pay for it later. Gosh, that sounds a... That sounds suspiciously like the way that the federal government finances everything, doesn't it? <laughs> and they bring us into that way of behaving. So if we didn't have the federal dictates on Medicaid, we wouldn't have as much money going away from public universities into Medicaid, and we wouldn't have the same burden that falls on people in colleges. And of course, when, when state colleges don't have to be responsive and you know they can send their prices up poly, uh, private colleges can follow as well the last thing i wanted to mention to you though was on uh, the big untold story about the collapse of our economy and uh, if if you don't know some details about it let me recommend a book the author is paul sperry s-p-e-r-r-y the book is the great american bank robbery why why did these smart people, these financiers, why did they make so many bad loans? You ever wonder about that? There was a federal law that was passed in the first part of 1992, before I got there. The federal law allowed the, uh, the bureaucrats, and the Clinton administration did it, and the George W. Bush administration did it too, to set quotas for how many loans were given to people of lower income. They called this not just, not just loans to low income people, but loans to very low income people. Now this was not the Community Reinvestment Act. This was something different. And it got to where the dictate required that of the loans that were bought back through Fannie and Freddie, it got to the point where 28% of the loans had to go to the bottom 16% of income. 28% of the single family loans had to go to the 16% of people that had the lowest income. Technically, it was the bottom half of the bottom third, and it varied by where you were. Now, why would a banker make a loan like that? Why would a mortgage company make a loan like that? Because Fannie and Freddie were buying it back from them which is why we've paid hundreds of billions of dollars in bailing out Fannie and Freddie, and we're not done yet on that. But it was federal policy that dictated loans had to be given to people who could not afford them. And why did the bankers care? Because the loss was handed off to Fannie and to Freddie. And therefore, when those people couldn't pay their loans and the whole industry collapses, and yes, you can talk about the packaging of deals with Wall Street, and that's certainly a factor. But the untold story is what the federal law dictated. And the Obama administration right now, through this brand new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, is trying to bring back elements of that very same law. Why do you think the value of the typical American family, their net worth has gone down like 40%? 
in this collapse that did not start because we had too few federal regulations. You know, the president says, oh, you know, we, we've been down that road. It happened because we had too many, too many federal regulations that required people to do dumb things. So if you wonder, why is it that you cannot afford energy, college, health insurance, your home, new cars, this and many other things, they trace back to the federal policy. And if we don't explain that to people, they will not understand that big government is not their buddy who just gives them things. Big government is the reason that they find, you know, one wage earner in the home is not enough. We gotta have two wage earners, or maybe they did an extra job, but then the economy's bad, so how do you find this job? You talk about things that have clobbered the family budget. The federal government has done that. And if we don't explain that to people, where they have a stake in keeping the size of government small, so it's not handing out these mandates, it's not imposing these, these dictates, then we will not be able to appeal to people who are thinking about, well, what's in it for me? What's in it for people is the opportunity to have more control of their life, more control of how they spend their money, more control of their family budget, and more personal freedom because the government does not impose so many extra costs that they have to spend so much time working to provide because things are so expensive rather than spending time with their family. So thank you for, for letting me spend the time with you. And uh, uh, I've got the series of papers with the Steamboat Institute about the kitchen table agenda, which I hope you'll find helpful. Thank you. Hey, Ernie and Matt, would you like to take some questions? Absolutely. All right. One of the things that I hoped would have happened in people viewing Obama and his whole administration is that people would see that the government can't do, because he has been so totally unsuccessful at making government work the way that he perceives that people might be able to start to see the big picture and realize that this was not the direction that we should be going. Unfortunately, I don't really see that happening. I just wonder if we did the right kind of advertising and if enough people talked about that, that we now have a president that thinks that the government is the answer and the solution and not the problem then maybe people would begin to see the bigger picture that we need to scale it back. That's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I mean I, my, my sense, I, I think one of the things to keep in mind is the extent to which we are all very much engaged in politics and we, we talk about these things. This gets back to the point Ernest is making. Uh, most people don't. There has to be moments when something breaks through in order to get their attention. Um, and and it, when it breaks through, it doesn't break through necessarily in the same way it would for us in the sense that we learn a fact and we immediately see the answer. It has to occur over a period. And I think we have entered that, that period. Uh, we might not think they're as, as quickly picking up on this as we would like them to, uh, but the American people are clearly seeing the faults of government in a way they have not seen in the past. I mean, the, the trust uh, of government, if you take that as a measurement, is, is, has collapsed and has remained collapsed for some time. Uh, a lot of these programs are, are seen as generally failing. Obamacare, its, its numbers are very bad, despite the fact the Supreme Court, in a bad decision, um, upheld it, and the Supreme Court is one of the most trusted institutions in America. So I, I think that you know, it might not be happening as rapidly as we would want, but it is happening. The question is how we now take advantage of this moment and, and take that uh, confusion and take that concern about government failing and not being able to keep its promises, which it clearly can't. There's, most, most people are worried about Medicare and some of the big entitlement programs because government cannot fall through with those promises. How do we take advantage of that, show that it's in their interest, but then unite these things into this larger agenda and then carry that forward? There was a time when it was easy to see that uh, it, it was easy to see that we had prosperity 
uh, that had come about thanks to the Founding Fathers, the Constitution, uh, the, the principles which we followed. But it's not as easy to see that right now. When someone is having difficulty financially, or they're, they're among the unemployed, or they're underemployed, uh, they're having trouble making ends meet, uh, they don't see the same thing of saying, isn't it great that we have these wonderful blessings that come from the Founding Fathers? They're apt to listen to somebody who will demagogue. Uh, like Barack Obama, he'll say, you know, under my plan, the cost of your health care insurance are going to go down $2,500 a year. That appeals to people's self-interest. Of course, it hadn't happened. It isn't happening. They've gone up closer to $2,500 a year. And you've got to compare the promises with the actuality and make that point to people. But you, you've got to show them that it's not all it's not all just uh, goody good things that they're doing. Take the whole green program. The, uh, the Solyndra situation is such a huge opportunity because it's exposed what's really going on. It's people that are, that are using a huge federal subsidy program which Obama, by the way, in a speech here in Denver uh, about three months ago, said he wants to double down on his green energy and green jobs agenda. I know he made a speech, I guess it was in Pueblo, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, talking about, oh, we've got uh, you know, these jobs in Colorado from, from wind energy, he was making one similar to that in, in Iowa, but they're jobs that depend upon federal subsidies plus laws that require utilities to buy more expensive energy, alternative energy, rather than more affordable energy. And when you realize that wind and solar, generally speaking, will cost five to 10 times more than fossil fuel to generate electricity, then you've got a talking point you can talk to people about. But most people to get no farther than Oh, this is the green agenda. Isn't it great? I mean, we all want clean air. We all want clean water. Let's give people credit for the accomplishments they've done in cleaning things up, rather than this pretense that we're all going to die next week because we're not environmentally conscious, and therefore we've got to pay in multiple ways. We've got to pay in subsidies. We've got to pay in political cronyism. And we've got to pay in higher electric bills and uh, I mean, just pull out your electric bills from a few years ago and compare them with what they are now, especially when you have these dictates to use alternative energy, which, like I say, is more expensive energy. We've got to tell people that. It's their money. Uh, Ernest, uh, I'm Will Potter. Uh, I'd oh, like, there you are. like to direct a question. Ernest and I have chatted over the phone, but this is the first time we've met. Uh, my question for you is, uh, do you feel that, uh, do you subscribe to Denise D'Souza's uh, conclusion that Big Daddy Obama's game is, is a lot more serious than what we're really talking about today in terms of uh, He's, he's such an anti-colonialist that he has a, a very threatening agenda, which is really beyond what we've talked about so far. I, I've not read D'Souza's uh, uh, works on it, and I've not yet seen 2016, though I plan to. How many people here have seen that movie? A fair number, okay. Um, so I'm interested in those things, but, but I gotta tell you, I am still more interested in, uh, in the things, I think those things will, will typically reinforce the commitment of people who already know what the problems are, but I don't think they help people, help persuade people who don't yet realize what the, pro what the problem is. So that's, that's the challenge there. But uh, to me, whatever label we put on it, you know, uh, anti-colonialist or whatever it may be, uh, I, I think we've still got to talk in terms of how it affects individuals' lives, not just how many billions of dollars it costs and such, but how it affects 
people's family budgets around the kitchen table. I want, I want to add something to that. Uh, the, the, um, no, I, I think that, that, that is exactly the point. I think what President Obama is, I think the, the, the threat he places uh, on this country is much greater than we're currently discussing, um, which goes back to this idea of what America means and what America is about. I'm not sure it's anti-colonialism as, as much as it is, that's a, perhaps a part of it, but it's, but it's that he, he harkens back to a, 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 this progressive philosophy that it completely uh, denies philosophically and practically what America means. Mm -hmm. What he replaces it with is another question. Uh, but that's clearly what he's arguing for, and I think that we're in a, an unusual situation where the interests, which is say the, the costs and the programs and all these are, are coming together, uh, but in the midst of that debate, he has decided to go forward and double down on his larger argument, and he is actually, he is making a transformative argument. He is running a realigning election. What, what becomes interesting now is that you've, you've got the other side who's raised their argument as well. And so we actually now have this debate about what America means. Mm -hmm. But what President Obama ultimately wants to do is, is to try, as, as he can, to revive this more transformative and radical sense of liberalism. Uh, so you have uh, Dinesh's book. The other book I would, I would, I would uh, point you to or to look forward to, uh, another book that's coming out uh, by a fellow named Charles Kessler, uh, I Am the Change, about, about Obama. That one will be out soon. And, and, and he has a very strong, he really goes to this argument about looking at the waves of liberalism and how um, uh, President Obama really is a, a very, very fundamental challenge to the very definition of what this country is about. Um, my point is those things are now engaged, uh, but that's not where the American people are. That is not where they are. So you, you want to you make the argument about, about the cost and the particulars, mm -hmm. so it's, they, they see it's a cost to them. But at the end of the day, I'm convinced that if you can make a large argument to unite those things with this under, understanding of America, the American people's gut instincts is still despite 100 years of liberalism is trying to change the culture. Americans still think this is a great country. It is exceptional. It's different for some reason. And it has something to do with this understanding of opportunity and individual self-government. Yeah. And if that comes out and comes to a head, this will be a, a cl clear, divisive, and decisive election. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with Matt. You've got to come at it from both directions. You've got to come at it from the self-interest of the people, and you've got to understand the, the philosophical framework. It right. just depends on which, which group, frankly, you're working right. with. Which, which uh, of course, was, I mean, if we talk about the founders, right? When you right. read the Federalist Papers, what's, what is Madison's great argument about America? Right? It's a combination of things. Federalist 10 is about what? Self-interest. Mm -hmm. We have to recognize the fact that most, many people uh, are often driven by their self-interest, whether it's, you know, base uh, self-interest or just or, or good self-interest in terms of earning a living. Yeah. But you have to combine that with a more noble vision about what the country is about. Yeah. And that's exactly what the founders understood and that's the way they, they looked at it. And, and if, you, if you really look carefully at some of Obama's rhetoric, uh, there was a, a statement he made recently where he, he in essence said, Mitt Romney doesn't understand how an economy works. Yeah, he did. And he went on and said, you know, I, I'm, I, I understand that I'm committed to, to build, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact turn of phrase, but basically he was saying, I, I want to have an economy that gives, uh, basically that puts people to work in a fair way. You follow me? It wasn't just simple enough to say, I want to enable people to go to work. It's got to be done within this framework of what he defines as fair. All right, so final question, I guess. Um, question, you were bringing up the topic of uh, college costs and how dramatically they're going up and skyrocketing. And at a certain point, it's going to get to um, where individuals aren't going to be able to afford college. And, I mean, granted, not all degrees are created equal in the sense that an uh, underwater basket weaving degree is probably not the same value as an engineering degree. But at a certain point, <laughs> someone that's going into engineering, they're not going to be able to recoup their costs. They're going to be basically taking their entire life to pay that back. Um, where do you see the future of college tuition or graduate uh, tuition uh, going? I mean, granted, there's a lot of variations in what could happen, but do you see a tipping point? Do you see uh, like what the potential is on that in the future? Sure. I think some of it starts with the people that are appointed to be trustees. There's an organization known as 
uh, American Council of Trustees uh, or College Trustees, I forget the technical name, but they tried to point out the things like you mentioned underwater basket weaving or all the different fluff courses that come in. Some of them is out of political correctness. Uh, there is the, the cost of federal regulations on colleges has not been fully examined, whether it's the cost of Title IX, uh, the civil rights requirements. You've got things such as uh, University of Arkansas at, uh, or, yeah, University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Uh, the Justice Department wrote them to say, you've got this student that's planning a, uh, that, you know, he's dressing in women's clothing because he intends to have a sex change. So you've got to let him use the women's restrooms. I mean, you know, when the Justice Department is dealing with things like that, uh, and all the other immense number of federal regulations on colleges, they're a factor. But until people understand that originally they felt their, their state taxes were going to support institutions such as colleges and universities, and then a switch has been done. The public funds that were committed to those have been withdrawn and put into providing health care for people instead. Until people understand that that's the trade-off how expensive it is to provide government-financed health care, and the Obama plan is just going to make that situation worse with Obamacare, until they realize that that has been the big trade-off. Pay I, I, for people's health care rather I, than I'll give you a, 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 a more direct answer to your question about education. Uh, complete and utter market collapse. Mm -hmm. Higher education is the biggest bubble this country has ever had. Yeah. It is a monopoly. It completely controls education. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have been working for, for, I mean, the conservative movement from the beginning always saw the universities as a problem. We have gone after them. We've created alternative institutions like the one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But you know what's going to happen? Technology is going to destroy it. Yeah. Competitive technology. Look at what's happened to the networks and newspapers today. That's what's going to happen to the universities. Small universities can use technology to deliver better products more quickly and efficiently to better students. The big universities are going to have huge endowments, so they, a lot of them will survive. Harvard, in my opinion, is a lost cause. <laughs> Don't send your children there, in my opinion. Um, but having said that, there, there's going to be a new competitive market of those mid-range colleges and universities, and you're going to see more and more of them popping up, and you're going to have competition for your education. Uh, and it's going to take a while to get through that. It's probably going to be pretty messy, but it'll happen a lot faster than you think. Look at the newspapers, uh, and it'll be much better for the country in the long run. Yeah. Which is one reason the Obama administration goes after the for-profit colleges, because they represent the cutting edge of competition and remote learning, like Matt's describing. Okay. Great. Thank you.